On the 25th of May, 1660, Charles II landed at Dover to claim his throne. This was no ordinary succession. Charles had spent nine years in exile and his kingdom had been a republic for over a decade. His father, Charles I, defeated by Parliament in the Civil War, had been put on trial and found guilty of attempting to subvert the liberties of his subjects. In a shocking rebuke to the idea of the divine right of kings, Charles had been publicly executed on the 30th of January, 1649. While the Convention Parliament had voted unanimously to restore the monarchy and its constitutional powers, declaring Charles II to have been king since the date of his father's execution, unpredictability hung in the air of Restoration Britain. As Dr Claire Jackson explains, no other monarch was so acutely aware of the extent to which his survival depended on his subjects' goodwill. This would have been a challenge in the best of times, but the 1660s had seen the return of the plague, the Great Fire of London, and war with the Dutch. For some, this was proof of God's displeasure with the king's serial adultery. Others simply feared the king's private life was a distraction from the pressing business of government. Meanwhile, Parliament's goodwill was tested by ongoing disputes over the royal finances and lingering uncertainty about Charles's intentions with regards to Catholicism and his backroom dealings with the French king, Louis XIV. If the monarchy was going to survive, Charles would need to rebuild royal authority and restore the majesty of monarchy. This began with the king's coronation at Westminster Abbey on the 23rd of April, St George's Day, 1661. Charles insisted that this be carried in accordance with every known ancient practice. So important was the ceremony in reinforcing his legitimacy and God-given right to rule. This is famously captured in John Michael Wright's portrait of Charles, depicting the king looking directly at his subjects, wearing his coronation robes and newly fashioned St Edward's crown. As a statement piece of portraiture, it is strikingly effective. The monarchy is back. spectacle was not just for high state occasions like the coronation though. It was also a part of court life, which returned to Windsor in 1674. Entertainments that summer included plays in St George's Hall and a reenactment of the military exploits of Charles's illegitimate son, the Duke of Monmouth, at the 1673 siege of Maastricht. The reenactment was staged nearby on land between the castle and the Thames and involved the construction of a fort, moat and counterscarp. Around 500 actors and volunteers played the defenders, with another 700 the attackers, jointly led by the Dukes of York and Monmouth. The theatre of court life was echoed in the country at large, as the playhouses, racecourses and gambling dens all reopened after the 11 years of Puritan dictated cultural austerity. Like the coronation, another spectacle that sought to assert the divinity of kingship was the healing of the king's evil. This was a practice, stretching back to Edward the Confessor, in which it was believed the king's touch could cure sufferers of a painful and disfiguring disease now known as scrofula. In the 25 years between the restoration and his death, Charles was believed to have touched around 100,000 individuals many here in the chapel at Windsor. From the divine to interior design, Windsor Castle also shows us how the king could remind you who was in charge through the formality of life at court and by controlling who could access his presence. While any gentleman of quality and good fortune or the wives and daughters of the nobility could attend the court, only a select few were admitted to the more private and intimate chambers in which they could hope to catch the king's eye or, better still, be granted an audience. Refurbished at great expense, access to the royal apartments here at Windsor started with the king's guard chamber, in which you would find the king's personal bodyguard, the yeoman of the guard. From here, you might hope to be admitted to the presence chamber, where the king made occasional ceremonial appearances, 
such as when greeting ambassadors or receiving civic delegations. Traditionally, a palace's main audience room was the privy chamber, but Charles rarely used this as such at Windsor, so instead, as a privileged guest, we shall pass through to the King's Drawing Room. An abbreviation of withdrawing room, this is where the court assembled in the hope of speaking to the King. The sequence of rooms then culminated in the King's bedchamber, to which only the most important guests were admitted. Let's take a look. The King didn't actually sleep here. The bed you can see is purely symbolic of the intimate levels of access you had to the monarch. Here, in the morning and evening, you might be present while the king was dressed or undressed. The ideal opportunity to have an intimate conversation. Perhaps surprisingly though, for a monarch who made such effective use of ritual and formality at court, Charles could also be one of the most accessible monarchs in British history. He was frequently seen at the theatre and at civic engagements, and could also be disarmingly informal, such as when talking to people he met while strolling the gardens of St. James's Park. All the royal apartments at Windsor were lavishly decorated at great expense, with oak panelling, colourful tapestries, and gilded plaster ceilings painted by the celebrated Italian-born artist, Ferio. Although only three of the 19 ceilings painted by Ferio survive, his work at Windsor is considered to be the most impressive series of Baroque decorative paintings in the British Isles. Art was used to bolster the authority and legitimacy of the king and to magnify the ceremonial. First though, Charles had to re-establish the Royal Collection of Art, which had been broken up and sold off after the Civil War to fund the Navy and settle government debts. Plates, hangings, paintings and other items were returned to the Crown daily. 17 cartloads of goods were retrieved from Cromwell's widow alone. Many owners returned paintings voluntarily, some claiming that they had simply been looking after them on behalf of the king. Other items were forcibly repatriated in compliance with a series of proclamations and other legal measures. Some items though, especially those snapped up by princely collectors, were lost forever and can now be found gracing the walls of some of the most famous museums and galleries across Europe. By reforming his father's collection of art, Charles was creating a physical sense of continuity with the court of his father. Patronage of the arts was also a means, of course, of demonstrating cultural refinement and artistic taste. Equally important though, was the flood of popular artworks and commemorative goods bearing the king's image. From dishes and wine bottles to jewellery and prints, the King's image was everywhere to be found. Charles also had St George's Hall refashioned as a colossal throne room, complete with a dais and a throne that resembled a coronation chair. Rather than being used as a banqueting hall, Charles envisaged this as a symbolic space that would be used only at the greatest state occasions, designed to assert the majesty of kingship. The hall also honoured the refounded most noble order of the Garter. While Charles had always taken the order very seriously, he also used it to encourage loyalty or to demonstrate political favour among courtiers and foreign dignitaries. The symbolic power of the order can also be seen in the Star Building, now so altered as to be hardly recognisable. Originally, this had a 12 foot high gilt Order of the Garter Star on its exterior, designed to create a shimmering golden reflection in the Thames. Windsor was not alone in being remodelled and refurbished. Shortly after the restoration, the King's Office of Works was re-established and plans drawn up to restore and redesign a host of royal palaces, including the reconstruction of Whitehall and the development of Greenwich Palace. In 1669, Christopher Wren was appointed as surveyor of the King's works. Wren was, of course, provided with a unique opportunity by the Fire of London to ensure Charles left a profound architectural legacy. There were even plans to build a new palace to rival Versailles, overlooking Winchester, home to the court of Alfred the Great. While Charles initiated a number of building projects during his reign, Windsor was the only one that he saw completed. Costing more than £200,000, 
and largely finished by 1684, the work is considered his greatest architectural achievement. Charles did not rule by image making, spectacle and ceremony alone. He was also a shrewd politician. During the exclusion crisis, when the Whigs sought to exclude Charles's brother, the Catholic James, Duke of York, from the line of succession, the King was able to skillfully play on the public's fears of a return to the chaos of the Civil War. Together with his Tory supporters, he painted the Whigs as dangerous, would-be Republican rebels. After dismissing the English Parliament for the last time at Oxford in March 1681, Charles then successfully had the Scottish Parliament denounce the actions of its English counterpart, declaring that the succession was to be determined solely by the proximity of blood, not parliamentary statute. Victory in the exclusion crisis and the foiling of the Rye House plot to assassinate the King and his brother unleashed a torrent of popular Toryism that lasted for the remainder of Charles's reign. Combined with buoyant royal finances, Charles was now in a position to be bolder and firmer. We don't know how long the King might have been able to rule without Parliament, or where his Catholic sympathies or backroom dealings with Louis XIV might have ultimately led, as Charles fell critically ill and died on the 8th of February 1685 at Whitehall. While the popular image of Charles II tends to focus on his scandalous affairs, we should not overlook the great achievement of his reign, unlike his father, who lost his head, or his brother, who succeeded him but then lost his crown. Charles held on to his throne and prospered. Viewed from the anxious and crisis-ridden early years of his reign, this was no small achievement. <laughs>